in. Okay, welcome back. Um, uh, we were we had started our focus on um, the abused uh, today as part of our topic was counseling the abused. Uh, in the last one hour, we looked at um, uh, working with those who are um, in f physical abuse and what we may encounter, um, what are some of the uh, um, symptoms you'd see, how is it that you can deal and work with those who are emotionally, uh, uh, sorry, who are physically abused. Um, we'll go on to the next one, which um, uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, sexual abuse. <clears throat> now, to um, just a quick understanding of uh, uh, sexual abuse, uh, th that this again definitely does have um, um, uh, we, we write the focus is specifically only on any kind of abuse that's happening between adu an adult and uh, 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 a child that which who is younger than 18 years okay um, so the the understanding here is if there's a significantly older person and a younger child um, uh, uh, those below 18 years is what we will call as uh, any form of an abuse as a result that's coming from uh, sexual uh, contact is what we call a sexual abuse. So even if uh, it's a family member, even if it's someone from the outside, a known person, it's where we uh, is it's classified as um, sexual abuse. Now, psycho uh, when you look at sexual abuse, there's a lot of psychological trauma that can come as a result of uh, sexual abuse. Okay. Um, again, I, I think some of the things that um, we just may need to focus on is, if, uh, especially when a child is being abused, the um, it isn't very easy for a child, one, to understand or label and know what is actually happening or what is going on and that sometimes increases the fear increases the trauma increases the psychological burden that comes in as a result so much so because of the confusion of what is going on uh, in the child's body and in the child's mind the the um, question to reach out for help in itself becomes a confusion. Whether they should be reaching out for help, whether it's even right to reach out for help, would they be seen as the problem or the perpetrator themselves? Um, and, and it complicates matters, especially when the abuser is one that the child knows or, or the, the family knows, or if it's a close relative or if it's a close member of the family, it becomes even more difficult and um, uh, uh, burdened for the child. Then the frequency of abuse, the, uh, uh, the, in, the intensity of the abuse, all of that again causes a lot of trauma as well as confusion about what to do and how, how, this, go, how this can move forward. So. Um, so when we, when uh, generally, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, I think it's probably not very common that, especially if you're not working within a child children's ministry, that a child may come up and share uh, this, unless of course you know the the, the child it, it's uh, the, the child has true confidence. Um, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm looking at it as, a, as an aspect of it, right? Either how would you be presented with something like that? Either one, it's a child who comes up and shares the details or a parent may come up and share the details or someone known to the child comes and shares, shares the details. So one of the, uh, the very important things, especially when we're looking at sexual abuse is uh, the first point of um, the the need to believe the story of the the 
uh, abused who's coming in and sharing something with you okay and uh, sometimes the uh, that that can and and this is a, this is often uh, a case where the people come in especially those who have been sexually abused come in and share saying that i was never believed nobody believed me when i told them that it was why because it was may, may have been an uncle or it must have been a brother or it must have been a cousin or a, somebody a close relative that has a real, that who's really um, fit into the family or is like um, a, a, a person of authority there or a person of respect in the family and as a result it's it's either not believed or it's um, or it's looked with skepticism or it's been or it's asked to be hushed up okay so the first and foremost thing as those who may be people who are helping it is to be able to listen and to believe and to confirm that what a confirm means to them that you are there to help you are you have come there with a mind that's open to hear <coughs> and to understand where they are at okay because the minute uh, uh, an abused child feels that they are not heard they would one it, it actually causes a lot more of psychological trauma because there is a sense that they probably misread it they have um, they have uh, caused it or they have been in a place of uh, um, uh, you know, doubt themselves about whether it really happened. Now, all of that can happen, which can uh, completely lead to a significant trauma. Okay. Then it's important next, once you have um, uh, believed their story, it is to ensure once again um, safety. It's to ensure safety so that they are not put back into the same environment as before. Okay. So when you are dealing with an abuse, it is one to believe their story. Second is to assure and let them know that they are to come to the right place, done the right, th right thing, they will be supported ensuring that they do not get back to that same environment now we will come later now what if it is the environment of the home in itself that this is happening so for that one of the ways to deal with it is to help them write down or come up with key people that they can get enlist help from and this is what you do with the child so like in case it happens again what are who are the two three people you will go and share this with right um, it, it may not be in the same environment it could be in another environment in case it happens so you are actually equipping the child to know in case something like this happens it's first of all it's not right it's not uh, it's not uh, permissible and thirdly it is something that they need to reach out for help so that's what you would do with the with the child per se also definitely require help um depending on so so you know as per the posco law uh the 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 child sexual abuse law you you're supposed to be reporting any case of sexual abuse to legally you are liable to report cases of sexual abuse it is it's part of the indian law that that you have so if you do have it um you know you you get if there's a parent that's um, a parent you can enlist support from get them to file a case okay because that's something that is needed by law <laughs> now uh, what are the additional things that you need to to ensure is not to confront the abuser it is not uh, yours to confront the abuser it is important to uh, to ensure that um, uh, because here again remember the child is not in a place to protect themselves 
So you wouldn't uh, contact the abuser or uh, or in any way ask the child to contact the abuser. OK, so you're not uh, you have to be extremely careful because a lot of this has been spoken in confidentiality to you. Right. And you protect that confidentiality by not getting to the perpetrator because there could be a retaliation that can happen in some way. But to be able to deal with it by working with immediate caretakers, caregivers, so that uh, what, number one, protections uh, given. Second, the abuser is um, is not in the midst in, in in the presence of the child. And thirdly, there is some legal action taken towards the perpetrator. All right. So uh, th that's something that you would you would once again look to. <clears throat> now, uh, the 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 fact is that to open conversations with a sexually abused individual so that they can keep relating any other incidents back with you, either you doing that on your own or being able to establish a better network system within the family or within the trusted adults in the family to be able to do that is extremely important. Okay, The trauma that the child goes through is significant. Uh, like I said, it mean, uh, you may notice, um, sometimes you may notice behavioral problems, emotional problems that arise as a result of the abuse, depending on the extent, depending on the frequency. Um, it depends on a lot of things, what the, what the child has been exposed to. There can be fallouts as a result of certain emotional, behavioral, issues that come in. So they do definitely require professional help, either in meeting with the psychiatrist, as well as with counselors, as well as with um, with biblical counselors to help to nurture and bring them um, you know, to, to a place of wholeness. Now, it's not a one or two, three step process. It's not a one or two, three step process, but it's something that can take time. And even as survivors of sexual abuse, adults who are survivors of sexual abuse may need to come back for help and support over a period of time. OK, um, now, even as I think even as we're talking about sexual abuse, one of the things especially with sexual abuse that you're also going to be needing to do is prevention of sexual abuse okay and this just doesn't belong to the outside to the outside world it belongs to us as ministers or as parents okay i think a lot more as parents than maybe as ministers is being able to groom and help the children um, identify and ways of how they need to protect themselves from any form of sexual abuse. So something um, that you would do right from the beginning, you know, right from a time when a when a child is quite young, and let's say one and a half, two years is first and foremost. So there is in in, and I'm sure some of you must have heard of the good touch, bad touch programs, right? And and I think it's a very strong, good program to help educate young children about uh, protecting their bodies. <clears throat> so the initial steps that you would take in doing that is to first and foremost help them identify the names of their body parts. Now I've seen so often that uh, young children do not know the names of their body parts that even if they want to make a reference to it to let's say a stranger uh, or when I mean by stranger, like let's say a teacher or a Sunday school teacher or a, um, you know somebody else who's not within the family, they may use language that is not uh, uh, what's the word that's not legible to to others. Okay, so they may be asking for help, but when they don't, when when they're not able to use a language that is 
uh, that is understandable by by other people then uh, you know like for example if the abuse is happening in school and the child reaches out to a teacher and uh, is trying to attempt a communication saying that uh, you know i was abused or i was touched at such part of this you know th th there needs to be a proper communication so i think one of the first things that you do in that program is to help children learn the names of their body parts right the actual biological names that have been given to them and by helping them know that um uh, so so when you're doing that you're doing the, uh, many other things you're also helping them see that just as, as much as a hand or a foot or a head or a shoulder has a name so also do the other private body parts have a name and it is if you notice it's only the adult who has shame while labeling a body part when you tell a child the actual name of a body part they see it as a description they see it as a name okay there isn't anything that they see as odd okay it is the mind the 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 grown mind that associates negativities to certain parts of the body and what you're also doing as you are teaching young children names of body parts you're also helping them see that there are some parts of your body like as it says in corinthians have greater honor and that's why we keep them covered that's why we keep them unexposed because they have to be taken greater care of it care of they are of greater honor right so it, it's twofold the, the, this kind of an education or program is twofold so that's one you teach them the body parts the second is to help them see that there are some parts that are private to them which would be the mouth, the area of the chest, um, their private parts. It's so generally what we look at is anything that's covered in a swimsuit, as well as the mouth, is something that is personal to you. That that can that is that you do not permit anyone to touch or to hold, uh, except in conditions of when you need to go to the bathroom, uh, or when you need to have a bath. Or when, uh, sorry, when you need to go to a bathroom or when you need to go to a washroom or if you need to be checked by a doctor. And this usually uh, in the presence of a parent. And these conditions of in the bathroom or the washroom happens only uh, for the purpose of cleansing, purpose of cleaning, right? And nothing else. Like when they go to the toilet to get washed, maybe a young child doesn't know how to wash, they need the help of a maid or uh, will need the help of a parent. So this is something that you help the child learn, that these are personal parts except in do these two, three conditions. And the third, uh, and uh, yeah, and that, they, that any time there is any action that is done towards them that causes discomfort, that causes a sense of dislike, they should be they should say a no, you know, it, it said, call out a no, that's what it says, cry out a no. So there you are helping the child build up a system, a, uh, a system of mechanism where they associate discomfort with some physical action. Like, for example, there are, I, I know of children who've, who've told their parents, especially, you know, that sometimes parents could tickle so much so much that it brings discomfort and they say no right I, I think that's a, that's a good agency that the child is saying you know that's a boundary that that I'm placing and as a parent being able to respect that so helping the child build in that kind of a mechanism and the third thing is to enlist a number of uh, a certain number of people that they could go in and share if at any point of time, these this is violated if someone has violated their personal body or their personal space so this is what you we you would call a program and this is something you know as parents um, or as caretakers of young children we should be doing to be able to protect them from forms of sexual abuse okay before i go to the next one of emotional abuse any questions
Is it also possible that somebody who has gone through child abuse or maybe a very early in their childhood refuses to get married or um, maybe something wrong has happened from the close family and mm. they don't find a point in getting married and they don't want to at all? Mm. Uh, is it also possible? Yeah, that's possible. Um, a lot of things depending on especially you know when abuse happens from a trusted adult like like a parent <clears throat> or a or a significant member in the family if there's incest right like if it's a it's a it's another adult like a um like a father or a brother or a grandparent uh the, um, it's just not the act in itself right it's the psychological trauma that kind of builds up. Um, they, what happens is they construct a certain story in their mind about even a relationship or about a trusting relationship. So that can happen. And that's what you do in counseling. You, re, you help to reconstruct that trauma story. So a counsel actually helps the abused to revisit reconstruct the story you know in the confines of a safe place that's um that's established between the counselor and them and they explore and feel the different emotions that took place during that abuse so then it's not uh, uncommon for for those abused to learn new insights you know even as they are exploring it they're learning new insights about the attack and what they're feeling. So these things make up, you know, issues of trust or issues of uh, hate towards maybe people of the opposite sex or those in authority or those who appear a certain way. So once that is out, these fears and emotions, once these have been addressed, the process is to restore the heart, restore it to recovery. And bring them freedom from those bonds of that abuse so the hurt the pain all of that that actually crushed the abuse become tend to become part of the of a past of a, of a painful past but a past from which they have actually fully recovered so you what you're doing you're helping the victim reconnect the pieces of the puzzle of their abuse so once that picture is complete they look back at the past and bring to light how that past affects the present and recognize the symptoms of that abuse so one of the biggest gifts about christian counseling is what we offer uh, you know is to help them uh, uh, build uh, one is you know uh, uh, as as a as a believing counselor to build that trust that affirms that they are going to be protected, as well as to bring them to a place of understanding that there's hope, there's redemption through their pain. So yes, what you said is possible, which uh, which they, they make a choice of not wanting to do so. Maybe sometimes there are people who also go through counseling and decide that they would want to stay away from uh, intimate relationship. And that's a choice that they make. You know, uh, 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 informed choice that they make that they wouldn't want to, and and they would like to probably do something else. So that's that's fine. If they've been able to process it, they are free to make that decision and that choice if they feel it's a lot that's led them there. So. Yeah. Um, so just to add add to uh, what the question was. Uh, so if that person gets into another relationship, as we uh, discussed in the beginning of our course, like, would that person also uh, bring hurt to the next relationship? Like as we said, hurtful people hurt others. Right? So uh, would it be possible that the if that person is not emotionally healed, uh, would it be carried forward to the next relation? Yes, yes. A every kind of... <clears throat> um, 
personal um, trauma, uh, home situation, any of that that happens has a bearing on relationships going forward, has a bearing on the marriage going forward. Because uh, all of this are not just acts of its own. They have deeper emotional, psychological meaning uh, that gets constructed, right? So, so it is with this cons uh, construct that they that they grow, they get into marriage. It gets firmer uh, as they relate to other people. Now, getting into marriage, they begin to play out. Your emotions, your attitudes are what actually plays out in marriage. Your soul is what becomes alive in a relationship, right? And yes, so that that does affect. So that's why through pre-marriage counseling, that's one of the things that we recommend that that you know, if someone is abused, that they address, that they are able to address that before they get into a relationship because it can manifest itself. Yeah. So just I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm asking too many questions, but no, no, no uh, one more uh, thing just for little. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Let's. We spoke about the abuse, uh, uh, child abuse, or anything. But would also uh, that's because we spoke about marriage in the previous session. But it would also uh, loss of a, a loved one, like a brother who just went off. Uh, for for a lady, uh, her brother passed away very tragically, uh, very recently. And um, this this woman, this lady, has been. Uh, um, very upset about it and asking so many questions. Why should this happen uh, in my family? So would that also be a trauma emotionally, or is it quite okay? Because um, this is one uh, scenario which I, we recently encountered. So mm -hmm. should that need to have a, a proper counselling before they get into marriage? Is uh, one thing I wanted to know. Okay, so uh, so there are a couple of things now. Uh, we're going to be doing grief counseling uh, maybe ne next to next week. And that you will know, uh, you will understand that there is a process of grief, uh, especially with death of loved ones. Uh, a process of grief usually takes around six to nine months, which is actually quite a normal phase where there are questions, where there are um, bargaining, where there's anger, all of that is there. It is a normal process and that is part of grieving and people should be going through a grieving process, right? If there is anything that spills up after that, um, let's say nine months, 10 months, 12 months, a year, year and a half, then that's when we look and say that, you know, the trauma has been that deep that it's affected even normal functioning and normal relationships, okay? So if it's something that's fresh, I think it's too early to say. Um, whether it will affect a relation, a marriage or not. But I think it's it's worthwhile to know uh, what the kind of relationship has been. Like, for example, I have a person who had um, who had a brother who was going, who had a developmental, who, who was autistic. Okay, and uh, this sister was was the main caretaker of this autistic brother because the parents were at work. And, uh, um, and 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 so something traumatic happened to the brother. The brother passed away, and there was a lot of pain and grieving in this person's life, and because she was the kind of uh, um, support for this. Now, without having enough time—not that enough time to grieve—but without really being able to share what was going on in her life to her, so her her now husband at that point of time, um, uh, there were certain dynamics in that relationship which was not sorted out at that point of time, which has created an issue at this point. Okay, So so I um, we may say, we, we can't say that all everyone will go through that, but I think it's a case-to-case -case basis again, depending on the kind of uh, issues <clears throat> that, that these people may be a caretaker in, or the kind of trauma with which the person died, uh, the the kind of effects that this relationship had, if that has not been resolved. Anyway, what whatever you'd see is if there are deep relationships um, that that have been cut off as a result of uh, 
uh, as a result of death, it can cause certain certain aftermath issues. It can cause, all right. But they, I, I suppose, they are a lot more simpler to deal with because these are things that you can actually talk about and 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 work through. You know, getting counselling for that sense of a grief is something that you can work through. But yes, any trauma of trauma or any significant event of your earlier past can definitely affect um, your current, right? It, especially if, if your mind is not renewed to think differently, it can affect. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, all right, we'll move into the last one, which is uh, someone else. Yes, Divya, go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, like, uh, for children, uh, as mm -hmm. you said, uh, who are not able to uh, really communicate, right? What what happened to them, or if if at all uh, an abuse happened for a child? Uh, so, as a, um, like as a uh, an adult, what are some ways that you can help the child, or uh, you can uh, understand something is mm -hmm. not right with the child? So, is there something that will indicate that? Okay, yeah. so so some of the things, uh, and and now um, um, there are there are very good in very um, uh, conventional interventions that are there, which is like play therapy, art therapy, where <laughs> where children are um, are given uh, opportunities to play with toys. In in a in a confined in a in a environment uh, where there is observation that's done, where they create their own stories through uh, through play, right? So so it's almost like um, now a child generally is not thinking. Okay, if I say this, then you are then it may it may appear as if I'm telling my story, right? Children are are um, much more trusting, right? So then they actually, when, when the focus is not put on them, when it's either on play or when it's on art, it's somebody else's story. So those are a few ways that that uh, they can be helped to communicate what uh, is going on, OK? So those are two things. The third thing is looking out for certain signs and symptoms. You may see children who are abused. Now, again, please. Please don't take what I'm saying in isolation, OK? Um, and I'm telling you why, is that it is normal for a, <clears throat> for a two-year-old or a three-year-old to explore their own private parts, OK? They would put their hand on their private parts. They would explore. They would explore their own private parts. It's a normal phenomena for them to do that. That does not mean that they are over sexual. Okay, it is a, a phase of discovery that they are trying to see what is part of their body parts and what it feels like. Right. So don't take what I'm saying in isolation. But there are certain signs and symptoms you can notice, especially when when there are children who are uh, abused. First of all, you will notice it in their emotions. They could be withdrawn. They could be um, very volatile, aggressive, uh, um, um, quite brash, quite rude. Right? You could see it in their regular functioning, maybe their studies or whatever they are involved in. All of that kind of uh, probably there's a decline in that. Uh, there could be some sense of adult kind of behavior that you may see, right? Now, this again depends on the abuse. You may notice that they are speaking certain words or using certain language or talking about certain certain things that they may not even understand. But you, you may notice that it's probably something that has been used during their abusive uh, interactions with the perpetrator. There can be um, some kind of sexual behavior that you may see, right? Depending on uh, on the age of the child, maybe 
uh, forms of masturbation, forms of um, uh, voyeurism, voyeurism meaning exhibiting private parts. Now, these are in in cases where where abuse has has been long standing, has been extremely intense. These are all some of the cases, but there are certain symptoms that you may got. Again, we don't look at it in isolation. We look at it in um, uh, we we look at it in respect with a with a with a whole lot of lot of symptoms, right? So yeah, one way to get them to to really know what they're expressing is through these ways: play, uh, play, art, um, um, even depending on the age of the child, the writing stories. Uh, all of that, and there are certain tests also to really um, determine whether there has been a traumatic event that's taken place. And and the second thing is there can be certain symptoms that you may notice as a result of um, sexual abuse. There could be depression. There can be sudden anxiety, decline of academic uh, issues, and with addition to these kind of sexualized behavior, talk language, um, forms of dressing, any kind of an exposure uh, to earlier sexual experiences could could be displayed, could be manifested in their lives. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah. OK, yeah. right. OK. All right. We'll go to the last one, which is uh, <clears throat> which is uh, emotional abuse. Now, um, Emotional abuse, as uh, 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 you know, as as is, is probably the most difficult ones to identify, because unlike the other forms of abuse, there is no signs. There's no outward signs. You can't see a scar. You can't see a mark. Or you can't see um, there is there's nothing. I mean, not a scan. Or none of that will actually show you that uh, emotional abuse has happened. Okay. Um, but emotional abuse can be pervasive and can be, like I said, easily missed out uh, by those uh, caught up in that entire um, uh, cycle of that of that uh, of of that relationship. So it can occur between spouses, between uh, parents and children. It can occur between between el the elder, uh, the, the younger and the elderly, you know, the, the really elderly, the uh, elderly 60 plus, 70 plus. Okay? So knowing the types of emotional abuse and their signs can also help identify that there's a, there's a problem. So some of the common abuse that we see that's happening is, uh, you know, those milder ones are the yelling and the screaming. Um, uh, the con uh, the the name calling, mm, then it is the constant criticism, threatening, uh, the suppression of uh, the emotions, dismissal of emotions, um, beating at a person's self-esteem, beating at a person's worth. Um, it, it's it's basically damaging the internal value or worth of a person. Okay. And uh, this is emotional abuse is often referred to as psychological abuse. So unlike physical abuse, um, the here in emotional abuse, the abuser works to control and manipulate another person, generally with threats or humiliation, name calling, sometimes even isolation. Okay, and this can happen. Uh, and, and some of you must have heard this word called as uh, emotional blackmail, where you threat, where the abuser threatens to harm themselves, okay, um, so that they can get what they want. Okay, they threaten to harm themselves, or their uh, their their tag, or they they threaten to harm the person, or other family members, such as their own children, um, uh, in order sometimes to get what they want. So the emotional abuser can use this as a weapon okay, uh, in order to get what they want, or may use isolation as a weapon to cut the person off from other people who actually could help them. Like, for example, an emotionally abusive husband may demand that his wife um, you know, unfriends other people in, in her social media. So in that way, 
they're trying to cut them off. Okay, So the abuser can use different tactics to control the person, such as gaslighting. And this is probably a word that you all must have it must be very commonly you're hearing okay it's what does gaslighting mean is to deny that they have actually said or done something and that they just be and they're just imagining it so actually denying that uh, what they deny is that their past abusive behavior um uh, you know was even there okay so these forms of abuse can actually leave a very lasting imprint on the uh, abused so an emotional abuser again tends to behave in a pattern they may act out of control and uh, uh, reckless for a period of time because of their emotional volatil volatility and then when they're confronted um, the abuser will use psychological abuse to intimidate and control their spouse or, or, or the other person so it, it's true that they could offer an apology for what they have done uh, and may say, okay, from here on, I won't do it. And they will kind of keep a line uh, until they feel that they, they've got the support and they've won over the victim. But then the cycle begins once again. Okay, <clears throat> So some of the types that you see um, uh, that, that an emotional person can bring, an uh, emotional abuser can bring up, um, is, uh, again, emotional abuse is all about, just like in physical abuse, it's all about control, okay? And they can use either control, that is through emotions, right? If you don't do this to, for me, then I'm going to do this, I'm going to leave. Or if you don't do this for me, I'm going to go kill myself, or I'm going to cut myself, you know? So that keeps the other person in control, not able to separate, okay? There could be accusations and denial. So that's another method that's used. There could be a where you're accusing the other person of the of the issue or of the fault and denying your contribution in it at all. That you know, you've been the problem. I've been okay in this. Or there could be humiliation. Humiliation is where you you bring down the esteem of another person. Or isolation, where there is complete emotional blocking. Okay or blame that's always put or code or codependency okay so, so some of the examples that we can we could probably think about this is you know like an emotional abuser can make threats towards those they love okay and to control that they may always keep the person uh, on edge with their behavior one minute they may show love the other minute they may be getting upset with you then they show love again so it becomes an extremely confusing cycle okay they uh, they may bring flowers or they may do so much to make the person feel that you know that they were sorry but then they get back into that same uh, route again okay um like, like for example an emotional abuser could often check on you over and over again like maybe wanting to call you or text you they expect an immediate response, okay? Um, and suddenly, when, when that doesn't happen, they will just uh, come up uh, unexpectedly at the workplace or unexpectedly at an event. And then, you know, they, they, they may go through history or they may make a huge issue that um, almost makes it look as if uh, the other person was at fault, right, for not picking up the call. Okay, so then, or uh, other examples like when, let's say, when, when it comes to matters of finance, uh, the abuser could treat uh, treat the person as if they're ignorant in that area. Okay, they may withhold cash, they may keep away cards from them or uh, lecture them about basic needs. So that, that there again, there's, there's a specific sense of control that happens, okay? Or... Um, uh, what you would notice is that the emotional uh, abusers insecurities are quite loud and they project them onto other people they are supposed to care about actually or they're supposed to be in love. So those in an emotionally abusive relationship are accused sometimes even of cheating of their mate. Okay, Although maybe their affair isn't true, the abuser 
um, um, it, it could also happen that the emotional abuser themselves could be in a in a in in an extramarital affair in its in itself. Okay, so the uh, the, the point over here is um, to remember that emotional abuse abusers create a pattern of behavior, and the abuser may repeat this behavior over time and seek guidance also from from people, uh, uh, you know, to to be able to. Uh, uh, to portray that they are they're getting help okay but it's important to understand these patterns of behavior so uh, for um, uh, uh, someone who's uh, abused to begin that process of healing one of the important things is that they may need to step away from the abuser and from that uh, environment and uh, you may notice this a lot more among dating relationships and yes in marriage also it can happen but a lot more in dating relationships where they feel stuck in that kind of a relationship right and a lot of times i've seen young christian um, youth coming and say i know this is god's will for me but nevertheless uh, you know this is this is uh, that this is his weakness or this is her weakness and they were extremely protective of me it feels good but they're protective of me um you know, sometimes they get they get uh, annoyingly angry but once they're angry they you know douse me with a lot of love and a lot of uh, uh, flowers and uh, you know all of that and then we're good again and this goes back again right so it's important to help them see to step back from that okay and to help them build back the worth that has that has been lost through that so because emotional abuse the problem is it can lead to other mental health concerns or, or issues like um, depression like anxiety like pt post-traumatic stress disorder sleep issues um, uh, you know it, it can also lead to a sense of codependency not being able to work through and and get support through those things so here again you know when people like this come it's important first and foremost to just be supportive and not tell them what to do right it's to be able to hear them out okay and help them come to a place of moving away from the environment from that abuse so that they are able to think about what it they need to need to do and also help them see that they're not responsible for the actions or for the anger or for the for the impulsive nature of the abuser right uh, to come to bring them to a place of understanding that they have been tricked to believe that uh, it is because of them that such a response has come about so that in itself takes time for them to just talk and relive and speak about all of this to get to an understanding okay the then it is to bring them to a place of really uh, living in that um, understanding of who they are in, in in christ and this this i'm specifically talking about believers right those who uh, who the freedom that they have in christ the fact that in a relationship god desires that that uh, you know you you bring about your roles just as much as the other person does and then you don't have to be in a place where um uh, where you are held responsible for somebody else's thoughts and and uh, feelings so once getting over there is to is to bring them to a place of uh, uh, working through those deep emotional wounds that have come about, you know, through the through the word of God, through prayer, through renewing their mind, through coming to a place of, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, challenging all of those thoughts or all of those statements that's been told to them, those wrong ideas and belief systems that's come over them, that's kind of been cemented in to be able to work through that to come to a place of freedom. So just helping them to work through the word of God through those different practical ways. And then to really help them reconsider um, you know how ab about the rela relationship or getting help for for that for the person who is an abuser. So in marriage, of course, here it, it, there's there's a lot more of work to do, right? It's just not helping uh, the one who's emotionally wounded, but also to help uh, the one who is wounding 
And usually you will find that those with these kind of emotional problems, we classify some of them having a personality disorder, you know, so or to get that kind of support and help so that the relationship can be mended and worked through that. OK. All right. OK. So this was uh, um, I tried the best that I can to bring this all in a nutshell. Uh, quickly, we are at on time. Any questions? Uh, maybe one or two minutes we just spend on questions and then we could stop. <clears throat> yes, Devya, go ahead. Yeah, my question is uh, if, if, if a couple doesn't understand that they are going through something like this, maybe they understand in a, um, you know, in a, um, in a sense, uh, they mm -hmm. understand it, but they don't consider it um, seriously or uh, to to get help. Uh, but on, on the outside, if you understand that this is what uh, is going on, um, how can you help such such a couple who who really don't think that they need help, but from the outside, <laughs> we can understand that. Uh, this is a cycle that is going on. Uh, uh, I, I mean, that's a good question. I, I myself don't know how do you get people help when they don't think they need help. Is, um, is I mean, what I do is, I mean, I just pray. I said, Lord, you know, they need help. They need to come out of this cyclical pattern that they built themselves in. And uh, and I think sometimes I've seen the answer as things get worse for them, till mm. and 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 then they come for help. Mm -hmm. So things may need you know you they need to be pushed to the corner till a time that they will finally land up with for help. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, and it is it is important to I think when they come in for help, it is important to tell them the truth, show them that this is not about A or B, but it is about what's happening in the system here. It, it's the kind of uh, characteristic traits that they bring in to this relationship that's causing this, and mm -hmm. uh, to be able to come to that. So yeah, there may be times that maybe the emotional abuser may. Um, may agree or say that, yeah, I, I am in a pattern like this, or they may not. You know, usually, yeah. generally, a lot of people with personality traits don't firsthand agree, right? It's only after they've gone through multiple relationships, multiple issues, um, you know, they go in from pillar to post, from mentors to coaches to counselors and psychiatrists, and then they figure that, okay, there is probably something that's wrong. So personality issues are definitely harder to deal mm -hmm. with rather than just behavioral uh, issues. Mm -hmm. OK, OK. Yeah, even if like uh, to at least to cope up in the relationship, if at, at least uh, one partner uh, goes, it will be helpful, right? To yeah, just absolutely. cope up. <clears throat> absolutely, yes. To to be able so what so in this case let's say it's the victim that comes right so what mm -hmm. you're helping the victim do is to deassociate all that emotional uh, baggage that's been coming the breakdown that's coming from the from the uh, partner uh, it's to deassociate that and help them restructure a new understanding about about what god thinks of them you know they may know it but then because of this constant um, uh, barrage of uh, emotional tra trauma that keeps coming in, it it kind of takes over what is really within, right? So mm -hmm. to build them up in that stead and to build them up in that truth is definitely important. So even if it's just that one person, the victim comes in, I think there can be a lot done. You can, you can you build them up in the right frame of, who they should be seeing themselves, not in the light of what the abuser is saying, but in the light of who God calls them to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. OK. All right. OK, I think we'll we'll close. Let's uh, just pray. And I think even as we pray, I'm sure each of us have uh, come 
uh, uh, you know, do know of people who've either been physically abused, sexually abused, or even emotionally abused. I think let's just keep them, um, you know, just before God, before the throne of grace, and ask that the Lord um, gives them uh, the help from the Holy Spirit to heal them, to bring them to a place of help or support, uh, whatever their need is at this point of time, that they will find that. And God would minister uh, uh, his presence, his healing, his opportunities, um, his doors of help from others to them. So if you know anybody <coughs> among what we spoke about today, um, um, or if you are one yourself, uh, let's just take time to just pray. Okay? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your grace. Thank you, God, that uh, even as we see and hear that there is so much of evil and wickedness and righteousness all around. And God, there are many people, God, who are victims of difficult abuses and situations. Mighty God, we bring them in your presence. And Lord, name by name, even as each of us are thinking of people who we've come across, who've gone through these abuses, Lord, I pray that you will minister to them according to their needs. Some who need to open up, have the courage to talk and to get help. Some, Lord, who may need to get uh, away from an abusive relationship, the courage they need. For some who may be needing solace and comfort and strength, through the abuse, some who may be beaten down because of what's been told to them over and over again. Lord, for some God who's been sexually violated, who've lost trust, who have no faith, who've lost their direction and purpose of life. Lord, for those who have been in places of being the perpetrators, God, we bring all of them to your throne of grace. Lord, we see, God, that in your mighty power and presence, everyone is invited. And Lord, you minister to each one as according to their need. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will restore. Lord, that you will bind up those deep wounds every behavior, every emotion that has come as a consequence to these abusive situations. Lord, we pray that you give them an understanding of making sense of this and have purpose, Lord, on going ahead. Lord, we most of all, we pray, Lord, that the gospel will be real to them. Lord, that there will be people in their lives will bring about the good news of Jesus Christ, who comes to heal the brokenhearted, bind up wounds, and bring back restoration and wholeness. Lord, we pray that you will minister to them. If you need to use us, Lord, to minister to these people, Father, Holy Spirit, we pray that you will encourage us, you will give us, Lord, what we need to do to bring the love of Jesus over their lives. Lord, we pray for a protection over our families, over our children especially, even in the world that we live that's wicked and evil. We pray, God, for your blood covering over them. That, Lord, no form of abuse as children, as young adults, as adults, in any of their relationships, Lord, Lord, we come against it. We protect their lives in Jesus' name. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all. God bless. We'll meet you next week. God bless. Thank you, Pastor.